There's scary coronavirus news about the latest variants that are starting to sweep the country. Get around the latest vaccine. So if you get that latest vaccine, it won't keep you from getting sick. It'll just keep you from getting really sick. I've been walking around for a month thinking I'm immune for a while. It's Today in Ohio, the news podcast discussion from Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer. I'm Chris Quinn. I'm here with Lisa Garvin, Courtney Estolfi, and Laura Johnston. And it's interesting what they're saying about the coronavirus, that for older people or people with immune deficiencies, they should get the vaccine. But for middle-aged people, there's probably not much point because they have enough immunity now. They're not going to get really sick. And that's a completely different twist. My question is, is everybody going to mask up again now that these variants are starting to sweep? <laughs> I would say no. Yeah. I don't think so. Yeah. I actually, in our mudroom, we have a whole bag of masks. And I was just wondering, can I get rid of these yet? So I guess the answer is probably not. See, I, my, I'm of a different mind. If if it starts to sweep, and I know several people that have gotten it quite recently, if I go to stores and things, I might start putting the mask back on. I'm one of the very small number of people now in America that did not get the coronavirus. I'd kind of like to keep it that way. Hey, I didn't either. And I didn't either. Right. So you got to keep it that way. And Laura, I don't know how you ducked it because you got kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's mind boggling. Let's get going. We're not two weeks beyond Election Day, and Ohio Republicans are trying to make it harder for Ohioans to vote or use the ballot box to change laws. Let's start with Frank LaRose. With people planning to put a constitutional amendment on the ballot to legalize abortion, how does LaRose want to make it a lot harder to change the Constitution before those folks can come forward? Laura, it's interesting that LaRose didn't have the bravery to put this out there before he was up for re-election. He waited until after he was cemented for another term. He did. He could have done this any time in his first four years of office to up the ante to make it, you know, harder to pass a citizen referendum. He wants to raise this threshold for constitutional amendments from the current 50% plus one vote at the ballot box to 60%. But that would only apply to constitutional amendments initiated by citizen groups who start the petition to start the process. This does not work for the referendums that come from the state house itself. And that would still be 50 plus one vote. That's because LaRose says legislators already have to have a 60% vote to get their own amendments bogus, on the Constitution. Bogus, bogus, right. bogus. This is such a bogus move by this guy. He is trying to stop the citizens from being able to change their Constitution, but while allowing the legislature to pull the shenanigans they pulled last election with issue one and issue two. Those were bogus amendments that weren't needed, but they wanted them on the ballot because it was like red meat. We're going to let criminals out of jail who are dangerous to the community. And it was it was nonsense because the laws already applied. They didn't really change anything, but th- but they want to have it both ways. Mm-hmm. They, I, Frank LaRose in the last two years has become one of the most sinister forces in Ohio politics. You know, his his games about the election being stolen. Well, Joe Biden was duly elected, but I'm really questioning what happened in other states. It's total nonsense what he's pulling here and He's trying to stop the legalization of abortion. Right, because there are a couple of really big issues that are going to come up. Reproductive rights groups want to put a constitutional amendment about abortion in 2023 or 2024. Uh, There might be attempting gerrymandering reform again via a constitutional amendment because the last time didn't go so well. And progressive activists have been talking about putting a minimum wage to $15 an hour. All of these things are against Republican principles. And the thing is, it's not super easy to pass a constitutional amendment anyway. Like, yes, you can point to a couple that maybe you're like, maybe that shouldn't be part of the Constitution where we can legally locate casinos, right? But since 2000, there have been 16... Wait, 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 stop, 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 though. The legislature refused to move on well, that's casino true. gambling. They refused. And the general population wanted casino gambling. The only way we got casino gambling was because you could change the Constitution. The people behind it profited from it. But because the the, the gerrymandered legislature would not act, citizens had the ability and it passed overwhelmingly. So that I would say that's evidence of it working. 
Okay. I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I think it was probably a little too specific for a constitutional amendment, but you're right. The people writing the amendment get to pick what the amendment says, and then we get to decide if we want it or not. But since 2000, there have been 16 amendments proposed, 11 failed. So, I mean, that's not a super high pass rate at, at the 50 plus one right now. No. And look, I, I've all often questioned why it's almost as easy to do a constitutional amendment as it is to change the Ohio Revised Code. Usually, if it's just to change the law, it's easier than changing the Constitution. But that doesn't argue for making the Constitution more difficult. It might argue for making the Ohio Revised Code easier. But look, the timing of this, the person doing it, everything about this stinks to the high heavens. And I think... This may end up hurting LaRose if he runs for the U.S. Senate because Sherrod Brown will be able to say, this is the guy that's trying to destroy democracy in this state by removing your ability to change the laws easily when your legislature won't do it. It's a it's a dangerous move for him because there'll be a very strong fight against it. And my bet is it's going to lose. I just wanted to bring up that, you know, we were supposed to have a recreational marijuana you know, a, a amendment on the ballot in November, but they played some technical issues with the script. And I think that they, with the, uh, with the, uh, with the petition. And I think that they tried to keep it off the November ballot because it would bring progressives and Democrats out. So we can't forget. And so I wonder what the future is for recreational marijuana now. Right. There, I mean, everything, <laughs> everything, it, this is all an attempt to thwart the will of the voters. It's like having a small group of people thwart what Ohioans want, and Frank LaRose is the leader of the movement. Really, really sleazy move. It's today in Ohio. In part two of the election shenanigans, state house Republicans want to make it harder for you to vote, harder than it's been for the past cycles. Why and how? Lisa. So on Thursday, the Ohio House Committee approved several changes to House Bill 294, and LaRose hasn't weighed in yet because he says he's reviewing the bill to see what changes they're talking about. So these changes include no prepaid postage for applications or ballots, no unsolicited ballot application sent. They've been doing that. They sent $8 million for the November election, and Ohio's been doing this since 2012, sending them to all registered voters. Moving the absentee ballot request deadline to one week before the election instead of three days before the election. No early voting on the day before election. They would require an Ohio driver's license or state ID to indicate if the license holder is not a U.S. citizen. That's a scary one. $7.5 million for electronic poll books. They want to increase drop box security rules. They want to ban most August special elections. The original version allowing online voting and limiting drop boxes to one per county have not been touched. That remains intact. The bill sponsor is Bill Seitz. He says that, you know, he's gotten a lot of feedback from Dems and a lot of negotiating with Senate on this bill. But the Ohio League of Women Voters, Jen Miller, says she supports some of this, but she says, honestly, it will make elections more complicated, more expensive and confusing. The only part of this that I think makes a lot of sense is ending the August special elections, because that's something that school districts use if they lose taxes. They try and sneak it through when there's a low turnout. People do not generally vote vote in August. They're busy doing other things. And I've always thought that that was an odd one. But let's face it. Everybody talks about how well, including LaRose, how well Ohio elections work. Everybody decries that we don't have a greater turnout. And here they are overhauling the laws in a big way when everybody says they work and crippling the voter turnout. I mean, this is, again, talking out of both sides of your mouth. Frank LaRose tells everybody, Ohio's got a great election system, and now they're going to sabotage it because they don't want Democrats to vote. I mean, this is all aimed at reducing the Democratic vote. Well, and why are they against prepaid postage? I don't get that. They're like, oh, it's going to cost a million dollars. I think that way I'm, yeah, I'm quoting off the top of my head, but it's like, really? Come on. With the way we squander money on things in this state, this is, uh, and, and look, part of it is the confusion of the cost of this. You know, wh how, what was the note we got very late before election? Oh yeah, mm -hmm. your ballot, it, it varies depending on where you live, but one stamp's not going to do it. You got to figure out your postage and everybody's confused by that. 
So it would make much more sense to make this part of the deal. But it doesn't matter. Bill Seitz is trying to stop Democratic votes. He's he's a party over the people kind of guy. And that's what this is about. And the fact that they're pushing it again in a lame duck session when there's no accountability, it's sleazy move number two of the day. It's today in Ohio. Since we're talking about Republican antics today, let's talk about Jim Jordan, the Ohio congressman who gets national headlines for all of his antics. Will Republicans in control of the House of, with Republicans in control of the House of Representatives? What did he announce his intentions are as chairman of a powerful committee? Courtney. Yeah, Jim Jordan. So he made a joint appearance after it was clear that the House is going to the Republicans, right? He made a joint appearance with uh, Kentucky, Kentucky Republican James Comer. And, you know, Jordan's in line to chair the House Judiciary Committee. Comer's in line to chair the House um, Committee on Oversight and Reform. And together, these guys got up and said, we're gearing up to investigate Joe Biden collectively between our two committees. And and, you know, they described these supposed issues um, on the president's end. They, they said they're going to be investigate, investigating influence peddling by the president, his knowledge and participation in his family's international business schemes, and, you know, supposed evidence of federal crimes committed by and to benefit Biden's family members. And as part of this announcement, Jordan started talking about this New York Post, these emails obtained by the New York Post that senior intelligence analysts and media outlets are, you know, dismissing as, as a Russian disinformation effort. But but Jordan zeroed in on those emails and accused federal officials of working to suppress whatever issues he, he's identifying in those emails. And and the emails, you know, revolved around Joe Biden's son, Hunter, introducing overseas business contacts to his father. The president has said he's had nothing to do with his kid's business. Um, but we we heard here from, from these two Republicans in charge of these two important committees that they're going to press forward and, and look into these claims. It's just red meat for the dogs in their party. They're trying to make this false equivalency between all of the bad things Donald Trump did and put it on Joe Biden. I don't think America buys that. I mean, Fox News really buy it, but they, they buy Tucker Carlson. So, you know, they'll buy anything. But th th there's no way I think the center of the country is going to view Joe Biden as the same kind of huckster criminal as Donald Trump. It just doesn't work. But it's been a constant thing. Hunter Biden's laptop, Hunter Biden's laptop, Hunter Biden's laptop, like that has the equivalency of all of the stuff Donald Trump did. I'm not sure. I think the elections showed people are tired of this nonsense. You know, the a lot of the election deniers that were trying to take over elections didn't win. And I, it, it seems like people are are weary of the Donald Trump era. But that's Jim Jordan. He's the Donald Trump accolade. He's going to keep banging that drum We'll see if it gets much traction. Again, it'll get but some it, because of Tucker Carlson. Go ahead, Lisa. But isn't it interesting, though, that every Republican campaigned on inflation? They're not talking one word about fixing inflation. All they <laughs> want to do is go on a revenge tour. Exactly. So, hello, where's your in inflation plan? Well, they don't have an inflation plan. And, and you know, inflation is kind of bipartisan, so they can't. I, it's just, this is the red meat. It's for the base, but it's really stupid. It's a waste of time. But it's Jim Jordan. He's the embarrassment that everybody who is sentient in Ohio deals with. It's today in Ohio. We need a good news story after all that. And Baldwin... Wallace University provides it. What is the college in Berea aiming to do to boost the number of math and science teachers in the state? Laura, good thing. Yeah, BW is offering tuition-free master's degree for adults looking for a career change who want to get into math and science teaching. And it's good for the first 10 students who enroll in this graduate degree program starting in May. So it's going to use a mix of scholarships and state grants to eliminate those tuition bills. So it's using state money and then it's working with Meteor Learning. That's a private company focused on helping adult learners maximize their career opportunities in order to be able to offer this. And it's, I mean, that's cool. We need more teachers and uh, some people get tired of the corporate America and want to go into teaching. This makes it feasible to do it. It's a one-year program and you won't have to go broke. 
Yeah, I look, I think this is a terrific idea for people who are looking for late change in career that have some understanding of it. And I salute Baldwin Wallace for making it free. Best uh the best math teacher I ever had was my geometry teacher in high school, and he had a full career at the armory in Philadelphia before he went into teaching. Uh, I hope this attracts people uh, that want to do something in the later stages of life. I don't know, Lisa, you're retired. Are you going to go to Baldwin Wallace and become a math or science teacher? No, uh, 40 years of working was enough for me. The, the good thing is you don't even have to be in Cleveland to do this. Classes are offered fully online, can take in anywhere in Ohio, and they're going to work with students to find a place to student teach and do the clinical work near their homes. But I'm with you, Chris. My physics teacher in high school had another career first, and he was a great teacher. Yeah, I, 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 wonderful thing. Good for Baldwin Wallace. We always like Baldwin Wallace, and we work with him on polls, but this is something separate, and we salute him. It's today in Ohio. Let's stick with college news. Are any Ohio law schools following the lead of Harvard and Yale and some others now to remove themselves from the U.S. News and World Report rankings because they believe those rankings are not fair? Lisa, these rankings have been the the holy grail of all these schools for years and years. Now they're turning away. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's interesting that like the biggest law schools in the country, Yale and Harvard, are leading the way in not providing their data to the U.S. News World Report for their annual college rankings, which they've been doing since 1990. So and and then we heard after Harvard and Yale did, then University of California Berkeley School of Law also said they will not be participating. So we talked to some, well, only one talked to us. We tried to talk to Ohio State University School of Law. They declined comment. We also tried to reach the Cleveland Cleveland State University and Case Western University schools of law, but we didn't get any response by press time. So we did talk to University of Akron Associate Dean Barbara DiGiacomo, and she says they're considering dropping out. They, They, you know, they feel like there's too much weight on spending per student. She says that's unfair to state schools. Obviously, Yale and Harvard are private schools and and usually wealthy people attend them or they're on a scholarship. She agrees with the Yale statement that rankings discourage public interest careers in law, working class law students, and she says it it ignores school-funded loan forgiveness. So she feels that state schools that don't have as much money are naturally lower in the rankings because of that. And that's bothersome. Yeah, it's interesting because these rankings have been for hospitals, too. These are things that they fight for, that for years and years they fought for them. And if they drop, they get very upset. But all of a sudden it's, yeah, I'm done with that. And, you know, it's, I think it was Stanford I read has jumped on, but it looks like this is a wave. And I don't know, what does U.S. News and World Report do? Do they just independently rate them and not, not rely so much on the data being sent to them? I don't know. I, you know, and, and we do kind of middling in the rankings. I mean, I think the highest ranked area law school was Case Western Reserve University. Last year, they came in at number 78. And then Cleveland State University came in at 127. But if you consider part time law students, they came in at number 39. University of Akron came in at number 51 for part-time law students, but between 147 and 192. So we're kind of middle of the road, but I mean, I worked for a hospital that was number one in the cancer hospital rankings for years. And I sometimes wonder, why are we always number one? I mean, I, I, you start to think, is this rigged or what's going on here? Right. And and does anybody pick their their school or their hospital based on these rankings? Or is it just something that creates fodder for programs like this where we can talk about it? I don't know, but it'll uh, we'll have to watch this evolve. If these rankings go down in flames, uh, that'll be something that opens up a vacuum. It's today in Ohio. This is working out to be a day of threes. First three stories about Republican antics. Now three stories about colleges. This one's on Cleveland State. What's the big plan the school announced Thursday that would remake the campus? And did CSU permanently remove the name of John Marshall from its law school? Courtney, let's start with the big plan first. Yeah, CSU's board of trustees had a busy day yesterday, right? So at their meeting on Thursday, they revealed this this huge master plan to kind of make better use of campus, make some big changes, and hopefully help the city's economy as they're as they're shaking up their operations here. So this this master plan 
you know, was discussed, like I said, for the first time yesterday, and it could be up for approval by late January. And here's some of the highlights here. It's it's identifying sites for 16 new different buildings for academics, housing, athletics, potentially economic development partnerships. Now, a big one here is the renovation of the 20-story Rhodes Tower. It's currently an office and classroom building. The university once considered demolishing it, but they want to turn that now as part of this plan into student housing. So that's the potential future here, Rhodes Tower. Also on the chopping block is the Wolstein Center. We know there's been a possibility the university's been looking to get rid of that for a while now, but here's concrete plans somewhat to demolish the three-decade-old center. They want to replace it with a new multi-purpose arena and field house in a different location at, at Payne Avenue and East 25th Street next to the Inner Belt. And then where the Wolstein Center is located currently these are looser plans that are subject to change. They have to figure out exactly what they want to do here. But initially, they're looking to put in a, a quote unquote partnership district in this 10 acre chunk of town. And while it's not super well defined yet, it, this could be space where where the university would look to collaborate between university researchers and private industry. This could be some kind of joint work there, but they want to talk to the city and county before really nailing down what, what those plans are. And and as, as our reporter Steve Litt notes in his, in his write-up of this, this is kind of the physical manifestation of CSU 2.0, the big strategic plan that the university rolled out last year that's really aimed at boosting the number of faculty on campus and increasing the number of students uh, by about, by nearly 5,000. Right, right now, the population level's around 14,000. I remember when the Rhodes Tower a few years ago had enormous parts shut down because it was discovered it was filled with asbestos, but I guess they cleared that out. Look, the Wallstein Center is a bit of a pit and it never really had a role. It's kind of too big for a lot of things, too small for others. Although I have to say, I'm going to be sad to see it go now because that is where I got my vaccine. And that was a day of deliverance from the pandemic. Uh, a whole lot of people were down there for that but it's not surprising that's going to go. Check out Steve's story on Cleveland.com. Now, what about the law school? We've talked about this earlier in the week. Did they follow through and remove Marshall from the name? This is hugely controversial with a whole bunch of people. Yeah, the, the Cleveland Marshall you know, College of Law is, 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 is no more. Marshall's name has been stripped from the law school, and that came through a unanimous vote by trustees at yesterday's meeting. And this follows what, what a student group who's been pushing for this change, what they say is nearly three years of of a back and forth to figure out what to do with the name. Now, John Marshall is a is a giant in in the sphere of law, um, but he also owns slaves and and students and and faculty and others at the university. Kind of, eh, no, we need to change that. And and the trustees have now signed on. There's been a long committee and vetting process. They they sought feedback from, you know, alumni and students and faculty and. And this is the culmination of all, all those vetting efforts. They found that the Marshall name doesn't represent what they stand for as a law school. And they are now the Cleveland State University College of Law. I sent a text out earlier in the week about this, and the overwhelming uh, response from people was, this is bad. This is erasing history. And when I mentioned that, there was a, a pushback from people like, wait, 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 I didn't respond before, but I'm responding now. And the most touching one was from a black law student, female law student who said, I, I really cannot understand how there's pushback on removing this name. I am attending a law school named for somebody who owned people that look like me. And that is really hurtful. I wish people could see that from my point of view. And I get, I do feel like that's missing here. The people that are standing on tradition are not having empathy for the students that are there now in a school named for a slaveholder. It's a very interesting story. Yeah, and, and you know, Students Against Marshall, this group that's really been pushing for it, sent out a statement that I think really speaks to that yesterday. They, they identified themselves as the future alumni donors and leaders of, of Cleveland and, and of the law school. So, like, there has been pushback from alumni, but, but these are the new alumni, right? And and it's it's right. their name going forward. Yeah. It's today in Ohio. 
I prevaricated. We actually have a fourth college story, sort of. We asked Northeast Ohio what it thinks of forgiving student debt, a big part of college life. Lisa, what did they tell us? Yeah, this is more good data coming out of that uh, Baldwin-Wallace University poll that Cleveland.com and the Plain Dealer Commission on on a variety of subjects. And just to mention again, there were 504 Northeast Ohio residents in seven seven greater Cleveland uh, counties that were polled for this last month. So 70% of them support some form of student loan debt. 12% say no student loan debt forgiveness at all, and 8.2% said they're not sure. Now, the biggest split is between political parties. Republicans, over 50% said there should be no forgiveness at all, compared to the Dems, only 9% say no forgiveness. Now, when you go to some forgiveness in some form, it's 85.5% Democratic and then 43% Republican. Now, those with a college degree and higher income brackets are more likely to oppose student loan debt forgiveness. About 75% of those aged 18 to 49 and 50 to 64 age groups support some type of loan forgiveness. Broken down by race, uh, black support is over 77%, almost 77 percent uh, white are supporting student loan debt forgiveness. 65 and over, though, it drops quite a bit. 46% are opposed to all forgiveness, and then 47% support sometimes. So it's kind of split, actually. So yeah, interesting figures there. What, what I saw in this was there's a path to a middle ground. Our columnist, Eric Foster, fellow member of the editorial board, wrote a column about this in a very smart way about the importance of the courts in these things. But he said he and his wife had applied. And I heard from one of the regular correspondents who said, you know, I I could see loan forgiveness for people that are making under a certain amount of money a year, $50,000, $60,000. But I don't see it for somebody who's a lawyer making bigger dollars, that this really should be more about hardship. We'd save a lot more money by doing it. And, you know, you could have a sliding scale. This poll, the results of this poll seem to say that people might be okay with that. Yes. Of the 70% of people who support student loan debt forgiveness, 37 and a half say that, you know, all or some should be forgiven for lower income. And then, I'm sorry, let me back up. So, 32.7% say that only low-income people should get student loan debt forgiveness, some or all student loan debt. And then of the 70%, again, 24.5% forgive it for all, 19.8% forgive it for lower-income students. We did this survey as a gift, a, a reward for people who pay for subscriptions. You can only read it online if you subscribe, but it has made some really strong news stories. So I, we ought to be polling people more. And I said in a recent piece that, you know, elected officials ought to be getting in touch with people more because they're making decisions counter what the voters would like. It's today in Ohio. Here's another good news story, this time from our friends on the Cuyahoga County Council. What are they doing to help impoverished people avoid being locked up in jail simply because they can't afford bail? Courtney, this has been a big push by us to get rid of the bail penalty on the poor. I was really heartened to see the county council take this up. Yeah, this is a a nice use of ARPA money, it would seem. You know, council's using some of that one-time federal funding to give an injection of cash to the bail project, which is a nonprofit that, you know, works to bail people out of jail who are being held on low level bonds. And the only reason they're stuck in jail is because they're too, they can't afford those bonds. So, you know, these are low level crimes. These are, these are folks that, that aren't, you know, uh, concerned, you know, super, scary crimes or, or dangerous things like that. These are low-level offenses. And what what county council is looking to do is it's looking to put about $225,000 to the bail project that would allow the organization to hire a second person to, to do the work and research which cases and help connect people with resources once they are bailed out. And, um, you know, what this does is it applies to, to bails between $50 and $10,000. So it's not those million dollar bonds you see out there. And, and, and once folks are released, 
bail disruptors, hook them up with support for housing, groceries, employment. The goal is to keep people's lives from de- being disrupted as they await trial, right? So we know people can lose jobs. We know people don't have the ability to provide child care and take care of their families when they're locked up unnecessarily. And the bail project's been around in Cleveland for a few years now. I think it's worth noting what they've accomplished. They've, they've helped 900 people avoid some bit of pretrial incarceration. And, and when we talk about whether this is an issue when you're, when you're popping folks loose, 95% of these people returned for their required court appearances. So it's not like the bail project's putting down money and these people are taking off into the night. You know what I mean? They're coming back. Right. And, right. and yeah, so, so County's putting down money. Initially, this was a proposal from Sonny Simon and Armin Budish with their share of the ARPA money. But as this went through hearings this week, council's president, Pernell Jones Jr. tacked on more money from his bid. So did Yvonne Conwell and Meredith Turner looking like they're going to contribute. Yeah, we smack these guys around a lot because they waste a lot of money. But if I had an applause button, I'd push it. This is a good use of that money. (laughs) It's today in Ohio. And Laura, we're going to go long because you have to talk about your car. Laura bought a new car this year. And it was bad timing because prices were high to go with the high demand and low supply. With the economy cooling, is it a good time now to buy a car in Northeast Ohio? Laura? Well, I think this is a question we recently asked on the podcast and business reporter Sean McDonald delivered and is saving you money column. So unfortunately, it's not a great time to buy a car. I don't know when will be a great time to buy a car. (laughs) The demand for vehicles is still high. Supply is getting better. It's still not where it needs to be. So vehicles are still selling above sticker price. And the deals that you used to be able to get are just not there. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should sit and wait because of interest rates. They're high, they're likely to increase. So if you need to borrow money to buy a car, you might want to do it now. Also, if you have a trade-in, it's probably never going to be worth more than it is right now because used vehicles, those are going to get cheaper. So if you want to trade something in, go ahead and do it. But I do love this line from Sean. He says, you need to do what's best for you. I feel confident telling you to buy a discounted $5 box of produce, but I can't tell you whether to drop <laughs> 30 grand or more. I, I, I've i looked a little bit because I've been thinking about buying a car. And what I'm finding is the dealers are doing a lot of bait and switch. Like if you go, they show an inventory of cars. So if you inquire about one, turns out they don't have that car and they start trying to do other things. So, you know, I ended up having to unsubscribing and blocking them because they're driving me nuts. Mm-hmm. They don't have the cars it's, and they're faking it like they do. Very sleazy. It's not the time to buy a car. Yeah. And Sean says you should call because what they, the inventory that the online sites are showing are not always right. And um, so the no, average- no, no, they're intentionally not right. <laughs> they're trying to get you into their funnel so they can harass you with other models. It, it's a bait and switch scheme, clearly. I did not realize that on non-luxury vehicles, by the way, it's easier to get a deal on a luxury car, which that's a head scratcher, but non-luxury vehicles, the average price is $44,000 and $44,300, which Mm -hmm. that's pretty high. For a non-luxury car? Non-luxury car. Holy moly. Okay. That's today in Ohio. That's it for a week of news. We're going to have an abbreviated schedule next week, but we'll be, I think, at full strength on Monday. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Courtney. Everybody have a good weekend. Come back Monday. We'll be talking about some more news. 